can be a part of that and participate. Um, but uh, I just want to thank you all for taking the time, whether you were able to be here or not over Christmas, um, for your prayers, your support, and just really just being the church. You know, it's, it's really a beautiful thing when you think about what the church is. You know, that Jesus said that he wanted us to come and be the church in the community, to be the light. And um, every time we sing the song, we talk about just being the light in the darkness. It's reminding me of each one of us has a, a part to play. And so I'm excited about that. And Chuck's going to come up this morning, and he's just going to kind of follow up on the theme. It's kind of bridging the gap between uh, the Christmas services and then the series that we're going into. And just kind of talking about, like, how we can, you know, it's God's work, our hands. And sometimes it's about getting our hands dirty. And when we talk about that, it's just really oftentimes just being willing to go into someone else's life. You know what I mean? It can be messy. <laughs> My life's messy. Your life's messy. But when you're together, there's a sense of beauty that's right in the midst of the messiness. And so with that, Chuck's going to come up and do a teaching sponsor. Let's welcome Chuck. Hey. Thanks, Chuck. So I don't know if this is too close or I'm too loud. But um, so New Year's resolutions. I'm great at them. I have never failed any New Year's resolution. I know you guys are all surprised at that, but every single year, <clears throat> I've got the same one. You see, I started out with that I'm going to lose 30 pounds. So about three years ago, I went to the doctor. That's the last time I saw the doctor. Well, maybe two and a half years ago. And he said, listen, Chuck, you, you got to lose 30 pounds. And I said, I can do that, right? I can lose 30 pounds. I was doing pretty good. When I got married, I was like 268. And, but now when I went to the doctors, I was 248. So I'm like, I am on the right trend. It only took 10 years, but I'm on the right trend, right? So then I finally, I have this New Year's resolution, lose 20 to 30 pounds. And then when I do that, I am going to go and see the doctor again. I'm, I'm serious. Because then he wants me to do blood work. And like, you know, just like, you know, what's your cholesterol? Kind of things like that. So I'm like, I've done well. Every single year, I have lost 30 pounds. And so I have succeeded. But the good news is I have another New Year's resolution that goes along with it. I am going to gain the 30 pounds back by the end of the year, avoid the doctor, and then do it again and succeed. I'm not kidding. It's true. I do it every year. You can ask my wife, Misty, do I do that every year? Yes. So it, you guys should try it. It's awesome. I'm not a doctor, so I don't know if it's good. But you get to eat your way back to joy. And I love food. So, no, seriously, um, when it comes to New Year's, right, we always start the year with these resolutions that we're going to do. I mean, it's just that time of year, right? What, what is the next thing that we're going to do? And this year, what I'd like to think about to challenge all of us is to look at the life of Christ and to see how Christ lived and the reality of his life. Because Christ, you know, I, he said, come and follow me, right? He's the example. I mean, that's pretty basic. So, but before I, so with that, I want to look at how do we listen to his voice? Do we hear his voice? Honestly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come before you. I'm going to tell you I am not great at listening at God's voice. I'm just not. Over the years, I know I've struggled with praying. You know, what's the right way to pray? Where do I hear God's voice? Do I hear him in, in, in the amazing, beautiful things that happen everywhere, in the loud thunder, in the lightning, in the storms? Where do I hear God's voice? And I haven't always heard God's voice. 
And that's something that one of my resolutions for the year is like, how am I going to hear God's voice? How is our church going to hear God's voice? How are we going to do that? So one of the things I want to kind of draw us back, right? Because it's kind of a gap week, if you want to call it. It's, we just had Christmas. New Year's is in a few days. days. But I want to look back first before I get into what the rest of the year is going to be. So because I love it when people talk, I'm going to ask you guys my warm-up question. Nope, that's not it. Nope, that's not it. I've got a few questions you'll be talking about. Ah. So, I want you guys to grab three or four people. And now that we've gone through the Christmas season, now that we've gone through the beauty of it, all the lights that I don't get today, apparently, because everyone's taking a break, Sean, thanks. I like those lights. They were cozy and warm, right? I want you to look back. Think about your earliest memories when you were young, or maybe you were older, maybe you were a teen, maybe you were a young adult, of what Christmas was, that Christmas night. What is it that you remember about it that stood out? So what I want you to do, because I want to kind of look back, and I want to look at what we have celebrated. I'm going to give you about three or four minutes. I want you to grab three or four of your friends, or maybe someone you've never even talked to, and I want you literally to share a quick memory, and then when you're done, you know, I'm going to ask some volunteers, because I want to hear about what those memories are, because I want to connect what you remember in the past to the nativity story and the life of Christ, all right? So go ahead and do that right now. Take three or four minutes. That is, if, you, if we kind of, we have three themes here, right? We have love, we have charity, and then we have fear, which is good. But, okay, let me turn this off before I do something to it. Um, for me, my earliest Christmas memories were a combination of all of them, but I'll never forget growing up Catholic that, which was fun, but Midnight Mass, as a little guy, and I had a brother, we were about a year and a half apart, and you know, usually we go to bed at eight, nine o'clock, right? We're seven, eight years old, whatever it is. So to stay up and try to stay up right to Midnight Mass, that was pretty awesome. That was fun, right? And our parents always allowed us to open one, one gift before, and maybe they were smart, because they're like, now they're going to play with the gift and actually make it to Midnight Mass. But as we would walk into, into Midnight Mass, we had to dress up, and I didn't like that, right? I'm, I, I wear a tie at funerals and weddings, right? And not that that's a bad thing, it's just something I should do. But I'll tell you, like we had to dress up, walk in there, we had to be quiet. And if any of you have seen my kids running around, my, my brother and I were the same way. So my parents were extremely powerful parents with a lot of rules. So like we had to, we, I mean, we were there in midnight mass. We would walk in. Think of it. Smell of the pine, the candles, the wreaths, beautiful music playing, choir music. It was amazing to us. The pomp and the circumstance. That's what I remember. Solemn. It was beautiful. It sticks in my memory always. But then I want to look at that, and I don't want to cheapen those memories, but I want to look at the world that Christ came into, right? Our Savior that we've chosen, right? The King of kings, the Lord of lords, omnipotent, powerful, loving. I want to look at what he came into, right? So if we look at the scripture, it, Luke 2, 4 through 7, would, would anyone volunteer to read this for me? No one. Oh, yes. Yes. 
So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. When they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger. So that, um, you can keep it right there, because you know what? I'm going to have you read my other ones, because you have a very calm and clear voice. So the last line is the line that hits me. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger. And see, the memory that comes to my mind is in stark contrast to the midnight mass memory that I had. Because the reality is, that one line connects me to two memories. The first memory, and multiple memories, that that connects me to is the birth of my children. And how, and I'm sure everyone, because you've either been born or you have children, just a fact of life, the reality is that as we enter into the world now, we enter into a very sterile environment. It's clean, right? All the precautions are taken. We want to make sure that that child comes into a warm, although the delivery rooms are kind of cold, but anyway, that's an aside. But, right, we want it's safety, sterile, warmth, right? We want to make sure that they come in to a safe place. So when I look at this, the Savior of the world chose to claim, come into a manger. And that connects me to another memory that I have. I remember when I was younger, I was maybe anywhere from 10 years old to 15 years old, one of the things that I would always do with my uncle and my cousin, um, whenever we would spend our vacations in Canada, I would stay at my cousin's. And they were dairy farmers. So they had, they had about, if you want to put up my slide of my beautiful barn, right? They had about... 40, 40 dairy cows. So in the morning, I would get up with my cousin, and at night, I would get up with, I would, after dinner, we would go out with my cousin, and we would go out to the barn, and we'd have, I mean, you know, we'd put on our high boots right up to our knees, and there was a real reason why we would do that, right? And I don't know if you've ever spent a long period of time in Canada, right near Quebec. We all spoke French. We still do. But... <laughs> In the middle of the winter, the cows tend to spend several months indoors and not outdoors, which brings in some logistic issues in the morning and at night that you have to take care of, right? So the reality is that as we would trudge through that knee-deep snow, sometimes three, four feet high, right, we would get to that barn and we would, we would milk the cows. And, you know, being the younger cousin, I always had to carry the buckets before they had the pumps that went right to the bull tank. And I, so I'd be carrying all the, all the buckets. And, and uh, but the greatest part that I hated was when we milked all the cows, the next thing we had to do was muck out the stalls. That's so much fun. Because they don't leave for a few months. But you have to do this twice a day. And I don't know if you know this, but... I don't want to get gross on you, but 700 pounds of beef, right? <laughs> 40 of them? Yeah. Right? So you're going to push everything into a trough, and then there's a chain you turn on, and that chain just brings everything out to a great big pile in the back. Well, you can clean out that barn as best you can, and it's still not going to be a sterile environment. So after we'd muck everything out, we'd lay down the hay, we'd feed the cows, everything like that. That was great. It was fun. But we still left smelling really bad right? We still left smelling really bad. Think about that right now, that the Lord of Lords placed himself when he came onto the earth in a barn with animals, in a dirty, unsterile environment. Why in the world would the King of Kings enter our world like that? That's a question, as we go forward into this year, as a church, and as a man for myself and for my family, 
that I want to answer. Very quickly within his life, you can put up the next slide. If you could read this scripture for me. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. If you could turn the next slide. Nope, next one. Next one. Sorry. The next one. <laughs> there should be a picture <laughs> somewhere. A refugee. If you look it up in the dictionary, is a person or a group of people escaping from political harm, persecution, maybe horrible living situations. I'm not, I don't want to, I'm not talking politics at all. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. That Herod, that, think about this, within the first few years of the life of our Savior, born in a manger in a barn, unsterile and dirty, Christ chose that. Then, becomes a refugee. It's a powerful word. It's a controversial word. But it's true. Escapes from their home country because they are being persecuted to be killed into another nation. Probably didn't want them. That's just a fact. And then finally comes back home. Why would they do that? And what does that feel like for us? I, I'm going to sit here, I'm going to tell you that I never understood that in many ways it's very easy for me to be comfortable. About two months ago, my neighbor came to me, and they have a little church not far from us, and the, he said, Chuck, um, could you do something for me? And I was like, yeah. What's up? He's a new neighbor. Just met him. He said, would you teach an English class for me? Because the community we serve comes from a different country, and we just want to meet their needs. And the most basic need is that they need to learn to teach, I'm sorry, they need to learn to speak English so that they can have a better life. And I said, no problem. Like, uh, I'm going to go do that, right? And it's just an hour a week, maybe, an hour and a half a week. So for the first eight weeks, I went and I taught a class to teach basic conversational English. I was a teacher only. I didn't ask about their life. There's a huge language barrier. I couldn't speak their language. Everything had to be translated. I didn't access their life. I didn't go into their life. I didn't talk to them about their life. I'm not a perfect person. Right? I, I get a lot of faults. I should have. About eight weeks in, a young man, I mean, when I say young man, he's about in his 30s, married, then in this country, maybe four or five months, came up to me and said, you know, in his broken English, Chuck, would you be able to teach me during the week? And I, I simply, I just don't have the time, in all honesty. I don't have the, I couldn't. But it, was, but it was a point that I got to speak with him about his personal life. I was like, well, why, why, what are you doing now? Where are you working? He's like, I work, I'm between jobs, but I work as an Uber driver. And that's not a bad thing, right? But that's what he's supporting his, 
young children with and his wife. I did not know this. These people are in front of me every week. And I said, well, what, what did you do in your home country? And he said, oh, I'm a psychology major. I've got my bachelor's in psychology, and whether that access to social work, whatever it may be. I said, what? I said, but you're in my class. You're working as an Uber driver. Like, I'm thinking as myself, wow, look at what this can access. This person is a person who has a lot of gifts and talents. And this is where I missed listening to Christ. I never realized that in front of me, working as an orderly, not that that's a bad thing at all, was an engineer. Working in another area, minimum wage, was a teacher, just like me. And I had been teaching them, and I didn't even know. I don't know why they've chosen to come to our country, whether they're legal or illegal. Not, I never delved into that. I just went to teach an English class. But I gotta be honest, I shouldn't have been just teaching an English class. It opened my eyes. Christ made that same walk to Egypt. So Christ came homeless, he came as a refugee. But then, quickly, I want you just to quickly think about this. Then we skip through his life until his ministry begins, and he starts to choose different people that will follow him. And he goes to Matthew, and Matthew's a tax collector. He's reviled by his people. Tax collectors literally collected for the Romans. You collected from your own people for the hated Romans. And the way that you made money was that you charged more than the taxes the Romans wanted. Christ went to them and the people that Matthew hung around with. Now, I can continue, and I can go on, and I, we can talk about all the people that Christ hung out with. Our Savior was an in-your-face kind of man. He was in your face saying, hey, walk the way I walk. I was homeless. I was a refugee. I hung out with people that no one else would. And that's a challenge to us as we go into the new year. I'm going to play a quick video, but I want to leave you with this. Do me a favor when you get home. Go on to our website. It might have been two or three years ago, Sean penned a letter about that we're a church that wants to get our hands dirty. And exactly with that is what Christ lived. So as a church, over the next few weeks, as Sean talks about our vision, keep that in your mind. As we go forward into the next year, I want you guys, over the next few weeks, and into the next year, really listen to what Sean's going to be preaching about, about our vision, about who we are as a church. But really understand that the God that we serve came to get dirty, came to get messy. I talked to Sean earlier in the week, and I said, Sean, what do you think if I, I was thinking of putting like buckets of dirt out on tables so people say, uh, so I could say, hey, you get willing to get dirty. I, but then I thought about it because then I'd have to clean it up because I know Sean wasn't going to do it. All right? But the reality is, search your hearts. Why are we following Christ? We're not, none of us are perfect at all. I'm broken. I'm imperfect. I mess up nonstop. I get angry. I, I, I just do. But my God came to get dirty, and he led the way, and he said, come and follow me. So please, as we go forward, search your hearts. And let's find out how we can get dirty together. All right?
I'm going to close us in prayer. Lord Jesus, Father, thank you so much for today. Lord, thank you for the new year that's coming. Lord, I would ask that you just move your Holy Spirit on all of our hearts, no matter what our situation is, no matter how we think we are, whether we're worthy or we're unworthy. Lord, I would just pray that you move our hearts, that we begin to become that church, that light in the darkness, that decides to go into the dirt, into the mud, into the stable, into the manger, into the foreign country, so that we can get dirty as a church together, Lord. We can follow your example. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Chuck. So, yeah. so I just want to encourage you before we go that next Sunday, uh, anyone that's been new here, whether it's been a couple of weeks or a couple of months, there's going to be a pastor's Q&A time immediately following the service. So it's just an opportunity for, you to, for me to get to you, know you a little bit better, for you to get to me, know me a little bit better and a little bit about the church and why we do what we do. So I just want to make sure you're, you're aware of that. And um, with that, I want to wish you all a very happy new year. Be safe, have fun, and spend some time with friends and family. Thanks for coming to church. We'll see you next year.